Hello and welcome to another modeling video. This is Alan from the Makotaman at YouTube with a, another modeling video. Today we'll be doing a, another Q&A for February, uh, even though we're a bit into March. And we will proceed pretty much immediately. Uh, all of the questions are from YouTube alone. I've been a bit unwell, haven't spent much time online, so really happy with uh, what looks to be some really, really intense questions, just like uh, last month. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we'll dig straight into that. Um, just a bit of news. Uh, really crack out and really working hard on the 3D printer at the moment. Some videos about that coming really, really soon. Uh, the Fumina project sort of stalled a bit uh, to allow for a scratch build project for Gunpla Builders Australia. Uh, that will go back on um, really, really soon. Building a few tanks, so there should be uh, an output of tank videos now. There'll be a few more. Got a couple of tutorials on the cutting room floor and straight into it. NLI, Neon Light Illusionist, has asked, simple question here, top free Gundam designs. Oh shit. Um, look, the anime is all cool and stuff. Um, I don't prescribe to it too much, but there are a few Gundam designs that I uh, do dig. Uh, the Q Ballet is one of them. Uh, my most favourite of them all is the Gelgoog, the Gelgoog grunt from the original Gundam series. That's probably my absolute number one. And third, I could change from time to time. Um, I'll look at my wall. Uh, can't think of anything now. There's a lot of cool stuff out there, but um, Gelgoog's definitely number one. Uh, Cubelli fits somewhere in there. That's really cool. And there's just a heap of that I like, depending on the feeling, the day, the month, the year. It comes and goes, so, yeah. Uh, XDI Deed Peter. Can you explain on airbrushing nail polish more? What thinner to use, amount, etc. PSI. I have to admit, there are lots of really nice colours to be had. The last couple of um, Honing Your Airbrush Skills video, I've been experimenting, playing with them, sort of uh, getting familiar with them. Uh, just your base, normal colours, no metallics, they almost work exactly like lacquers. They're pretty, pretty cool. Uh, they're sometimes cheaper, sometimes the same price. So all you have to do is use lacquer or general purpose thinner. Uh, mix it the uh, usual amount, one for one. Low PSI from my personal point of view, 11 to 15 PSI. Dust on works absolutely beautifully. There are so many brands and every season there's uh, different colours and other colours become obsolete and never appear again and there's just so many shops and brands and I mostly focus on the budget stuff. Uh, from my opinion of uh, getting my hands on some expensive stuff, the only difference between the two is the uh, labelling, the brand, the marketing, uh, the sex appeal of uh, the more expensive one, you know, because if uh, Kim Kardashian's wearing them, everyone has to wear them, they charge top dollar if it's sold in the Kmart or something, you know, it's, it's a little more budget, looks good, almost all looks the same, but uh, yeah, uh, not much difference there, so have, have a look at the budget, especially end of season stuff, where they're in the big bargain bin for 50 cents to a dollar, you know, you're definitely winning there. You have to be careful, a lot are quite translucent, so you can mix it, you spray it, and you hate the design, so you have to really think about the undercolor if you're definitely using it. And then you've got your metallics. Uh, the metallic pigments are normally quite uh, larger than in normal paint, so they require a little more thinner, they require a little more uh, PSI. Uh, you have to adjust uh, to find out. The ones with gigantic glitter pigment, they will never go through an airbrush, though out of experiment, um, you can water them down a bit and paint them directly onto a surface. I've used thick glitter on things like uh, camera um, lenses and as a general effect on a figure's uh, clothing. Uh, that can be really, really cool, so do not discount the um, glitters. The glitters can be useful in all sorts of uh, applications. And, um, yeah, the translucents be a bit careful with. Uh, they require a lot of build-up. Um, that's why they're normally hand-painted, not uh, airbrushed. Uh, so just buy them, do a test on a spoon or something, and then apply it on uh, the kit. Don't apply straight on the kit, as I have been disappointed at one or two times. More or less with the um, nail polish, as long as uh, you make sure that 
they say lacquers or nothing, uh, they're lacquer based, if they say enamel, uh, avoid them, I've had no luck with enamel, but if you do buy the enamels, uh, you make sure you read the enamel part and you use enamel thinner instead, they will take a little while to dry. Uh, last tip with the nail polish, they've got a thing of uh, flaking off a surface, I've uh, painted it on um, an unprimed spoon and within three days it just cracked and peeled off completely leaving a naked spoon as it will do on your fingers because eventually you want the nail polish to come off. If you apply a primer, a couple of coats of paint, your nail polish and a top coat, it's there for life. And I've got a couple of models up there as testament. Uh, it's the interesting thing about nail polish, it is a very old form of modelling. People in the old wargaming scenes and science fictions and whatnot wanting to get that candy look before we had things like alclads and airbrushes and whatnot. Um, nail polish was the go and look like it's uh, getting a bit popular again. So I hope that answers your question. Gabe Crab, what kind of putty would you recommend for removing seam lines? Is there any tips for working with clear parts to remove nub marks? Uh, putty, uh, my favourite putties are, are Squadron Green. It's opposed to Tamir and other um, immediate dry putties, it sort of does not shrink as much, it eats into the plastic and it stays there. Uh, my current uh, seam line removal technique, which I haven't made a video about, is, um, and it's more so for bigger uh, troublesome seams, not smaller ones. So like, you know, down the leg of a Gundam kit, if it's longer than about three to four centimeters, I do this, if it's a tiny one, I don't glue the uh, two surfaces together with plastic cement, allow it to dry, run a tiny uh, line of super glue down the actual seam, allow that to dry, apply putty on top of that, uh, sand it down in 24 hours, and I have not had a seam split since. Uh, the problem with the old uh, Gundam kits is if you don't widen the butt joints and pegs a bit, so it's a really loose fit, not a tight fit, they have a tendency of re-cracking over time if you just um, snap them together and paint or glue them together and paint. Especially really, really, really long seams, things like on your master grades or um, anything that's more than four to five centimeters in length. Uh, I've seen a lot of people have this uh, problem. Sometimes the seam won't crack for like a few weeks, months, years later. But with uh, super glue running down the seam, um, I have not had a single seam split once and most seams I've been able to cover in just one go. So that's something you may want to consider. It's uh, really, really tedious. It takes a lot longer to fill seam lines than in past techniques and other recommendations. But just for some reason, uh, Gundam scenes, when you're playing with articulation and the tightness of uh, the snap action and the articulation and polycaps and all that, there's just too much going on and there's just a uh, disaster waiting to happen. So um, the super glue really comes in handy. Uh, next question, working with clear parts to remove nub marks. To that is when you're cutting the nubs off with your nipper, you leave about half a mil left over and you slowly uh, trim that off until it's uh, just a raised bump. You do not cut it up against the plastic. The reason why is when you uh, n cut plastic with nippers or you cut it with a knife, it stretches it and when you stretch the plastic it leaves discoloration even though it's the same color through. If you uh, use a saw or if you gently shave um, you leave it quite transparent and once you leave that tiny nub raised if you sand it and then polish it off you'll have a clear beautiful clear piece opposed to that weird white stretched mark uh, damaged piece of plastic. Uh, again, when I mentioned saw, I know a few friends, what they actually do is when they cut the nub off, they cut the nub off so it's really, really long, we're talking about 2 to 3 mil, even a bit of the gate left over, they get a fine tooth hobby saw and they pretty much saw it off just um, close to the plastic and then uh, sand and uh, polish it out to a perfect clear consistency. Uh, modeling uh, polishing sets and 1 and 2000 grit sandpaper is very useful. Uh, 6000 grit uh, polish is really really nice or compound polish with uh, a polish rag really works out with clears as well. Next question we've got quite a few to get through. Makester ST Hi. From some time ago I started to use many of Vallejo's mediums like metal, crackle or matte medium and others. 
only one that I'm not sure how to use it or what purpose have is a glaze medium. I don't understand glaze as a concept. Can I have some help from you? Best regards. Glaze is a term used in the art industry. Um, I'm familiar with the art industry because I live in um, an art studio which you've got the dolls and ceramics and everywhere. From my understanding of uh, glaze, because this is a Spanish term, uh, glaze is uh, mostly used in ceramics and it is uh, a top coat, either clear, coloured or solid that you put over a bit of ceramic to give it a bit of effect. Uh, it is guaranteed to be of a uh, glossy nature. It's uh, best bet to assume that it's pretty much gloss top coat and the idea with a clear glaze is, which is pretty much molten glass, that you mix all sorts of uh, clears and pigments and effects and oxidizers and all sorts of uh, crazy shit in powder form and uh, you mix it with this uh, molten glass resin concoction uh, you coat your um, work in it, you fire it in a kiln and you got this um, pretty trippy effect I assume with the modelling it's just pretty much a clear gloss uh, resin whatever Vallejo base is uh, the idea is if you got any pigment um, such as you know the MIG pigment stuff or metallic pigments or sh you know uh, pearlescent pigments uh, this is the medium that you mix your pigment or other crazy stuff together or glitter or something as a binder and apply to your model uh, this is not guaranteed. I don't know what uh, Vallejo's uh, intentions are with that product, but that's just my very basic understanding of uh, artistic uh, terms and uh, equipment. So uh, it's just pretty much gloss clear and they've just renamed it for marketing purposes. Okay, and uh, yeah, thank you very, very much for that question. C4 Beats. What is the best way to weather your model kits, i.e. paint chipping, blah, blah. As you all know, there are many, many methods of uh, weathering a kit. Um, panel washes, sludge washing, uh, paint effects, uh, gradients, uh, pre and post shading, hand painting, streaks, pigments, um, reverse wash, uh, sanding paint to an underpaint, uh, just painting chips tons and tons of uh, methods and the problem when people are learning modeling and they learn their first weathering method they'll only do that method and they'll do it to the extreme or one or two methods the idea of weathering and I've learned the most effective way is to get um, as many techniques together as possible and layer each one on your model in a strategic manner that makes sense to you and how that weathering will occur so let's say you want to go for something really really drunk junked you'll probably do the paint chipping effect so you'll have paint chips all over from salt weathering or whatever and then you'll panel wash it and then you'll uh, put some uh, pigments on it and you'll do a little dry brushing you'll do a little panel lining you'll do a little highlighting uh, you might apply a decal, so you might uh, dust on a tiny amount of paint filtering to make the decal look like it's disappearing. The more different paint uh, and uh, product uh, weathering techniques you can get and apply it one after the other as layers on top of your model, the more interesting weathering and intense your model will look. I've seen it in Fine Scale Modeler magazine and some other tutorials on uh, weathering uh, tanks, 35th scale tanks, like your big Mings and all that, and dioramas. And when they do like those crazy World War I uh, rust, mud splatter, just absolutely uh, filthy pieces and machines, uh, they do it in many, many, many different layers of different weathering. And they're uh, using an airbrush and they're dusting on tiny bits of paint to shadow areas and they're putting inks and washes and pastels and pigments and they put just many different layers of weathering that make sense to them. Uh, this may feel a bit overwhelming but not really. If you think strategically, so things that you need to do on a gloss surface, you play decals, you apply uh, a gloss finish, you do your gloss based uh, weathering and that's pretty much your decals and your uh, ink washes. Uh, once that's done and you put your clear coat on, the, um, your clear mat on, then you do all your mat based uh, weathering which is your dry brushing, your pigments, your um, dry brushing, all of that because it sticks to a matte surface better. 
and as you apply one um, technique over the other on top of each other it just starts coming to life but you have to go subtle and not too hard because it all blends together and just tells a really really interesting story uh, what I recommend is uh, find a place that sells like a ton of surplus uh, fine scale modeler magazines or go to your news agents and have a flip through it every month and when they do a big dirty tank special um, buy that and um, just have a look at how they weather uh, a large 35th scale tank with all the different levels of weathering. Now they may go to the extreme and do it extremely dirty but if you dial it back and just do it really really light as what a Gundam would look like it would make sense because if we're thinking about mud and paint chipping and I remember what um, Master Kawaguchi said in Sydney Australia he said you really need to think about how you weather your Gundams if it's flying in space it's going to get paint chips on its shoulder on its head on the top of its feet it's going to get a tiny build up of dirt and crap at the very bottom of its feet it won't make sense if there's a 15 meter um, wave of mud just suddenly hitting the side of its leg if it's on the earth it's going to have different type of weathering it's going to have a lot of building debris and muck and whatnot the first couple of centimeters up uh, its feet because um, up past its feet is probably a one-story uh, building people are a little smaller so it's going to be kicking buildings, debris, cars it's going to get really wrecked around the feet uh, at the as it goes higher and higher it's going to have less wear and tear around joints and where metal's touching you might have a bit of uh, chipping on its hands where it's doing a lot of fighting on its shield it's going to get a lot of uh, chips and whatnot on its uh, probably shoulders and whatnot where it might get hit from the top of a melee weapon but what you wouldn't do is have a few bullet holes um, you wouldn't have a sword slash across, across its chest or something because as we watch the uh, animation just one or two shots penetrates it blows up just one slash it penetrates it might just be a near cut and it might be a scratch but you model it as a scratch and not too many because you can only have so many near misses you know you're not um, uh, Jesus or something so I hope that uh, answers your question uh, Frog Many Mike 14 Man Mike Frogman Mike 14 is masking with the general purpose blue uh, painters masking tape as good as using hobby um, Pacific uh, masking tapes like Tamiya for example also any tips on how to get the best results when masking uh, reduce paint pull off I've had a play with the blue masking tape, I find it really really tacky even though you can buy the really really low tack stuff I find with a roll of Tamiya tape, even if you do a lot of masking a single roll lasts a very very long time so uh, it's just best to uh, stick to the Tamiya stuff is particularly if we're dealing with lifting with paint uh, the biggest trick to masking is how long you wait or how long you wait for the drying and hardening of the paint underneath before you put the tape over it's a waiting game it's a patience game uh, paint dries but even though it dries it hasn't chemically hardened yet so once it dries to the touch you need to wait it for it to truly harden until you start putting tape on to prevent lifting so for example um, acrylic paint can dry in a few hours it'll take 24 hours to harden enamel paint takes a couple of days to dry it could take up to five days to chemically harden. Enamel's the worst to mask with, even the hobby stuff. Lacquers can literally dry in a couple of hours. Again, the same with acrylic, because it's similar. It takes 24 hours to harden. So when I do masking, I'll do my airbrushing. I'll do a really, really um, a fine job. I'll put in fine coats to allow it to make sure that uh, each layer it's dried immediately. It's chemically hardening faster. But then I put a clear, a gloss clear on top. Um, because a gloss clear is shiny, it's non-porous, tape sits on it, but tape will remove without taking bits of it. Uh, masking tape doesn't like matte surfaces as much. So you put your glear straight after you finish airbrushing or hand painting. Uh, if it's hand painting, add an extra 24 hours, airbrushing quicker obviously. So you put a clear coat, you wait 24 hours, you do your masking, and then when you uh, paint on top of your masking, airbrushing is always the best, um, you go really really dry, you go really really thin, you want to apply fine coats, almost transparent and when you're aiming your airbrush right at the model you want to aim right on top of where you're masked and you just spray that. If you tilt the model so the mask is sitting on top 
and your airbrush is sitting at a 90 degree angle, there's a chance you could be blowing paint underneath the mask. So that prevents um, seeping paint underneath. And if you apply really, really fine transparent um, coats and it dries just as it hits the model without getting uh, orange peel, uh, because it's fairly dry, there's less likely chance of that also uh, affecting the mask and seeping under. Once you build up enough coats, it's nice and solid, you give it 24 hours to dry, <coughs> you lift the mask off, and you're pretty much gravy. Now sometimes it recommends when you mask, you don't leave the mask on for more than 8 hours, 24 hours. Uh, that's because of a matte surface, if it's on a clear surface, and if it does lift the clear off, it doesn't matter, because it's clear paint, not the paint underneath. So just remember, um, wait for it to chemically harden, 24 hours after painting, apply a clear coat, Apply your mask on um, after it's uh, completely dried. Um, airbrush uh, directly above the mask. If you're hand painting, uh, dry brush your paint on. So you thin it down, you put or load your uh, paint brush with paint, you wipe the excess off, and you just apply it really, really fine, leaving a scrape amount of uh, paint behind. This may be tedious for the hand painting people, but your paint job will not fail after all the work you've invested. Uh, okay, next question. Thank you very much for your question, mate. Stephen Burnside, I believe he's asked a few questions in the past before. Hello Alan, this isn't exactly hobby related, but I was hoping you'd be willing to answer. I would like to know more about you and what you do outside of this hobby. Other interests, your profession, etc. I hope this isn't too personal for you, but I understand if it is, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Um, I do uh, sincerely apologise. Um, Stephen, I uh, don't talk too much about uh, the hobby. Um, I'm also quite private with my uh, Facebook for many that may know. Um, I do work uh, full-time between two jobs. I'm not going to go uh, much further into that. Uh, there are uh, in um, technical engineering fields. My other hobby is LARPing. I uh, don uh, medieval armor. Um, oh, sh shit. My laptop's doing something funny. Oh, that's interesting. Sorry about that. Um, my second hobby is uh, medieval fantasy LARPing. I've done um, very heavy uh, medieval armor, um, chain mail or plate armor, uh, using um, latex swords, or sometimes we train with other items like bamboo, whatever. And um, we go on the field, uh, I'm a part of a war band called the 13-3 Company, uh, it's about anywhere between 20 to 40 plus of us um, depicting uh, Italian 14th century mercenaries after the Hundred Year War, and we uh, just pretty much fight other uh, fantasy or historically historical war bands in uh, large fields, um, we do a lot of uh, martial art training, uh, we've got experts in Hema and Kendo and all that, uh, wear costumes, do role play, all that sort of stuff. May sound uh, nerdy, may sound um, a bit geeky from the American point of view because they've got uh, movies um, depicting the guys that put foam around sticks and wear cardboard armor and do silly stuff like that. Uh, not not quite our stick. Uh, we uh, do what's uh, we're probably a little more involved than that. <coughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's just a, a small. Um, small introduction to all that sort of stuff so yeah I like to LARP, uh, I work full time, I like a drink, I enjoy uh, recreational uh, tobacco smoking, um, you know, pipes and cigars and stuff like that. I'm quite social with my mates and since a lot of my mates are uh, hobbyists in uh, Melbourne you know, we go out and do stuff like that. We've got our own uh, hobby club in Melbourne called the Mecca Workshop. We meet once a fortnight uh, very close to my place and just um, hang out, talk, build models, stuff like that. And uh, that's about it. Um, can't talk much else. I hope that uh, tickles your curiosity enough. Um, but yeah, don't, don't, don't feel bad that you've uh, 
asked a um, personal question. Because you don't know unless you don't ask. Captain Cavi. Have you noticed a big difference in the quality of model kits and moulds over your time in the hobby? And could you talk about the topic of moulds that companies use? Thanks. I've uh, been brought up when I was quite young, couldn't afford the model kits at the time, so I bought second-hand kits that were uh, mostly used in the 70s, like the old original Airfixes and Frog and all that sort of stuff, and comparing uh, those where they would be a two-part mould that would uh, create the gates and you'd have a flash mark and you'd have uh, seam lines and all sorts of things if it was convenient or not. Um, there was only a limited amount of detail that they could put on the front side, post the sides and whatnot. And that was fine, that was good fun, that was what I was brought up on. Uh, as time goes on, moulds become more elaborate. Uh, there is more moulds. Uh, it's more cheaper to create a model kit in tooling and moulds and whatnot. And they've got a technique called slide moulds where instead of just two parts that go together to create a sprue, there's many parts and they slide in and they can create quite complex and interesting shapes so there's uh, less parts to stick together. So if we're looking at the tank models that I'm building, instead of putting together the tracks where uh, you've got an individual wheel and the suspension gear and then you put the tracks around, uh, it's all molded in one piece because it can be quite complicated and not as fun to build or when you're doing the chassis of the tank, instead of building uh, the four walls of uh, the actual main box, which you can get crooked and not looking the best, it becomes uh, pre-molded. So it is pretty good. It is uh, pretty interesting. It makes model building a lot easier, a lot more realistic, a lot more truer than what the older subjects were. I actually both enjoy still making old models, which I crack out from time to time, and whatever the latest new stuff that uh, does come out. Uh, models can be a bit more... Um, complex, they can have snapping components, articulation, all sorts of uh, built-in gimmicks and incorporate multimedia without any uh, hassle or added expense compared to uh, the old days. So yeah, I could see there's a definite quality, uh, there's less faults, uh, seam lines are more uh, hidden um, strategically so you don't have to fill them. Um, parts are more three-dimensional due to sliding molds, they're of a higher quality, they're more cleaned up, more polished, more accurate. Though with all that, with more technique, tools, investments, development in the industry, the prices of course go up. But interestingly with a lot of the 70 second stuff where they make a very fancy S model kit, instead of charging you 20 to 40 bucks for one kit, or an extra dollar or something, they throw in two kits and you get two kits for between 20 to 40 dollars. So that's a nice little look offset as well. But uh, yeah, that's, that's roughly my opinion. On the more Gundam front type of uh, things, uh, there was a big jump from your stuff from the 70s to the 90s, um, from the 90s to the 2000s, and then nothing really big happened until you had the uh, introduction of um, ABS and uh, your real great stuff where stuff is really really tiny and multicolored and snaps together and whatnot. I think um, a lot of innovation in modeling is coming out of China at the moment. Uh, China is really waving the banner and leading away for where some of the world's best models are being uh, produced, both uh, Hong Kong and uh, the mainland. I feel uh, Tamir is slipping a bit, um, Bandai is feeling a bit uh, stagnant. Um, even though they've got a lot of different lines and uh, whatnot, I really enjoy uh, all the engineering that goes into their uh, high-grade lines. I've always been a big fan of the HGUC and the new high-grade stuff. The Iron Blood Orphan stuff is uh, pretty amazing, as well as the last two lines. Though uh, it's pretty much almost uh, the same. And I could see that um, they're not exactly catering or marketing to me. They're doing it to people that are being introduced new to the hobby. Someone that could pick it up and build it as a weekend uh, warrior project or as a toy collector. And that's completely cool and understanding. And that's why I'm not willing to complain. That's why I'm happy to go in the field of aircraft and tanks and whatnot. Uh, that answers the uh, question. Uh, that's general my thoughts and I think it's very interesting and I can't wait to see where ho the hobby is going to end up in the next five years. Uh, we've got Grant uh, Joshton. Hi Alan. I'll expand this a bit. Any chance that you could go through your process for using the ultrasonic cleaner for your airbrush? What do you put in it? IG straight water or something else? 
how far do you break down your airbrush, how often do you use the ultrasonic cleaner. I only spray acrylic paint. I have an ultrasonic um, cleaner for a while and only use it once with poor results. Keep up the good work. I do talk about a lot of a lot about it in my earlier honing my airbrush skills videos and I probably should probably retouch on that because I've sort of been a bit quiet on the maintenance front and more on the painting front. What I normally do is about once a month or once every two months I'll pull down my airbrush to as many small components as uh, possible um, excluding the needle which uh, sits outside so that's the nozzle off, the main body, the trigger, the air solenoid, uh, the back and all the parts in the back that revolves in pulling the needle backwards and forwards. It's put into a small Chinese food container and filled with lacquer thinner and placed in the ultrasonic cleaner with water. I'm afraid that uh, thinner or other uh, chemicals may corrode or damage my ultrasonic cleaner to the reason why it's in a different cleaner. Uh, I let it soak for a while. I turn the ultrasonic cleaner on up the uh, time so it probably runs up to 20 minutes in the ultrasonic cleaner and it may soak for a few hours. Wipe off all of uh, the um, murky disgusting paint and um, lubricate the internals, put it together. I recommend watching um, the Honing Your Airbrush Skills video back to basics. It's somewhere between number 10 and number 11. Uh, that will give you a bit more detail. As you're an acrylic painter only, uh, you could probably use something a lot less harsh than lacquer thinner. So same thing, ultrasonic cleaner, little Chinese food container, fill the ultrasonic cleaner with water. Your Chinese food container with um, Windex. Just your normal window cleaner. Let your airbrush soak in it for a few hours. Will not do any damage to the washers or anything whatsoever in as many small parts as humanly possible. Let it ultrasonic clean for as long as possible and because you probably haven't done it for a long time or if ever, pull it out, swap the internals with uh, Q-tips. Let it soak and clean up again probably in a second round of uh, fresh um, Windex. Uh, this is the first time because your airbrush is probably extra manky. And then after that, probably once, uh, depending on how many models you build, after every major model, or once a month if you're doing a lot of painting, uh, strip it down and give it a clean. The first few times may take a long time, may be tedious, but every time you do it you'll get quicker and quicker and quicker. Consider having a second airbrush so one can be in service and one can be in cleanup mode. If you have any further questions, get in contact me via PM or uh, the comment section and we'll assist you further. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, Glues Brothers, do you think the prices of kits are getting too high for the average hobbyist? Uh, no, not really. I think kits are probably a lot more affordable than they used to be in the 90s. In the 90s, I remember I could not afford anything that was new that was coming out or that was uh, really, really good. So any um, large 72nd uh, or 35th scale aircraft or tank was way out of my price range. I could only afford uh, really, really small kits, uh, second-hand kits, uh, the hobby products I couldn't even touch. And uh, with inflation and whatnot, kids got more pocket money, and the, um, stuff's gone higher. But I feel with your Bandai kits, uh, they've all got a smaller, cheaper range. You can get those aged $10 kits, high grades are within the $20 mark. Uh, there's a lot of military uh, kits, uh, older kits that are coming out of the market, kits coming from Eastern Europe and China that are a bit cheaper. There are more brands playing at the moment. Um, it's not about uh, big expensive kits anymore. I think there's a more uh, range of prices and a range of uh, models. So I think it's starting to get a bit more um, affordable for people with tight incomes or with uh, kids who has it as a hobby and only relying off pocket money or a part-time job. Um, if uh, it is getting a bit of a struggle uh, with money, uh, there are methods of building and painting your kits so that um, you're saving money, you're not exactly uh, spending on the most expensive products and airbrushes and thinners and weathering products and whatnot. You can buy um, artist uh, enamels, mix that up with a bit of um, uh, enamel thinner or turpentine, dry brush that on your model, allow it a little extra time to dry. You can still get pretty amazing results, it'll take a little longer, but you can still get amazing results on a budget. And with uh, cheaper models, uh, they're not as ideal, they'll have more seams, they'll have more work, 
but they can be just as rewarding. If you do desire to have something like uh, the latest uh, Perfect Grey Banshee with LED set and your pocket money is $10 a week, unless you're going to wait until you're 19 to buy that kit or you're going to be a bit um, uh, common sensey about things and probably just, you know, aim a bit lower. Um, then the brakes, I got a feeling that uh, people are a bit greedy, they aim for the stuff that's at the very, very top, and they don't exactly reach out to their means. Um, though I'm actually normally a person that enjoy a lot cheaper, a lot simpler, a lot smaller models. So, um, you know, if uh, your big expensive kits is your stick and you don't have the money for it, that's uh, quite unfortunate. But, um, yeah, I suppose if you wanted enough, you'd, you'd save money and stuff. But, uh, yeah, from my point of view, when I was 14 to now, um, there is a big difference. And um, I can almost buy a kit every week till back then. I could probably only afford a kit probably once every couple of months. Uh, Marco Brin. I know you don't have a large viewer base, but got to say, I... Sorry, it's funny written... I know you don't have a large viewer base, but I've got to say I have appreciated your videos. Has helped me take some of my kits to the next level. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. I really, really um, appreciate the feedback, and I'm really, really glad that it's uh, helped you out and uh, assisted you in the hobby. Uh, there are a lot of uh, YouTube channels on uh, modeling and kit reviewing and building Gundams and non-Gundams. I've uh, been in the game for a very, very long time. There's a lot of people that have started after me that's uh, surpassed me. I've made a decision a long time ago that I wanted to make videos that um, I would probably enjoy watching if uh, someone else has made, and that would be of uh, assistance uh, and help. Pretty much almost like putting a database out there for people to find and use as they see fit. So people could cherry pick my content instead of sitting there and watching every video uh, back to back. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful that I've actually got the viewership and uh, followers that I do have. I've uh, never really been jealous of the bigger players. I've never really had the funds, the time, the means to get the latest kit every week, uh, build it and finish it as soon as possible to review it, or at least the newest kit of that month, finish it and paint it and get it absolutely schmick in a few weeks. I am a bit cheeky and I do try to get my hands on the newest hobby products as soon as I can and be the first to review it. Not so much to be the first to review it, but that hobby product is just really, really interesting to me. I want to know how it uh, works. I want to see how it can benefit me and then share it with my friends and then beyond my friends, uh, the greater hobby community. Um, a, lot, a lot of us on um, YouTube and Facebook follow each other, talk to each other and just follow up on each other's builds. But um, yeah, I have a lot of fun what I do here. Um, I'm not too fussed on uh, where the channel's going. It's um, a lot of fun. It's uh, become a part of my life since I've been running it for about seven, eight years probably. And um, I'm going to continue running it, see where it will take me. I've uh, gone to interesting places and uh, got to meet very interesting people and done interesting things through... Uh, my YouTube channel through Gunpla Builders Australia, the Mecca Workshop, the Model Shows, the Gunpla Builders World Cup. I've uh, met interesting people. Uh, Mr. Kawaguchi, the guy who plays um, Amuro uh, from the original Japanese series. I've met directors and other people. It's, it's, it's been awesome fun as well as uh, the legion of many modelers out there. So I'll, I'll keep doing it. But uh, thank you very much. Um... Next question. Timber Swiss 3. Two questions. First, how are you doing? Uh, thank you very much. I am doing uh, very, very well. Unfortunately, my dog's sick and I haven't been at work. But um, besides that, looking after him and yeah, pretty smashing. Uh, he is getting better, so that's uh, excellent. I uh, hope everything is well. Thank you for making these uh, videos and helping out the community. Uh, thank you very much for your feedback. Um, it's all for fun and I'm um, very happy to be of assistance. Second, have you gotten a chance to check out the new Gundam series, Iron-Blooded Orphans? If so, have you, or what do you think of the designs of the mobile suits and do they inspire you to build their model kits? 
I have, to be honest, with each new Gundam series, I find myself disliking the mobile suit designs more and more. Um, even though on my off time, I do watch a bit of anime. Uh, the Gundam series are just fun. They're not my favourite series. Uh, the mobile suits are normally a lot more inspiring than the series or story or anything like that. I found, um, probably going a few series back, um, the last few series, is, even though it hasn't been interesting as uh, you see many, many years ago, I uh, really did not mind Iron Blood Orphans. Um, I'm enjoying the series. It's, it's quite gritty. It's quite interesting. Uh, the mobile suit designs are pretty cool. The Gundams I didn't think much of, but when uh, we did the Gunpla Builders Australia group build of the Barbaros, uh, that definitely um, grew on me and playing around with the concept and the design for different uh, colour scheme. I, I really enjoyed uh, my version in the Lance Connect colour scheme, so that was good fun. A lot of the uh, grunts in Iron Blooded Orphans I think are really, really cool. I've uh, bought quite a few of them, uh, probably more than I can possibly build to put in storage and build at a later date. So I definitely have uh, those. Um, some of the newer series have not been too bad, I'm probably a bit on the generic side, but it's there for promoting toys, model kits, whatnot. It's just a really long toy ad. And um, yeah, it's just fun to watch on a weekly basis, build a couple of kits, focus on some of the older stuff. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too fussed about it at all. It's, it's a good watch. It's probably been better than the last few. But uh, that's my two cents. I know uh, the whole anime discussion thing can sometimes get a bit salty, a bit arguably. Everyone's got an opinion. Um, everybody thinks their opinion are quite important. Um, I've, uh, the last many, many years, I've been avoiding the whole anime community, anime discussion, all that stuff, because it's just gotten a bit ugly, and I feel a bit disappointed it's spilling into the um, model kit side of things. But, you know, it's not here nor there. But, uh, yeah, it's all good. Hey there, uh, which is Ultra Dalek 7. Hey there. I very often use my super thin detail brush to paint my models, which has which has had me replace it twice in a few weeks. In the temporary absence of a detail brush, are there any other things I can use to craft to paint small details like uh, tool handles? Um, what you can do is if you buy uh, a soft synthetic brush, and if you've got a few synthetic brushes around, you haven't used a synthetic brush forever, and it's quite big. Uh, do I have an example? This is a ridiculous example. It's the closest I could find. No, no. Fuck that. This one's small. So let's say you get something like this, and that's all you got left. You don't ever use this brush. You don't care about this brush, and you need something um, really, really fine. Uh, cut down the bristles with your hobby blade until there's a few bristles left and just enough bristles and strengthen those bristles to hand paint and that should do that should do the job um, if you have a super fine um, paintbrush and it's not fine enough cut some bristles off that's a technique uh, my mum taught me and it's uh, served me very very well since um, in two weeks you have damaged two uh, brushes if you've known how you damaged them and it was an ex accident that's cool if you don't know how you're damaging them and you're just chewing through them uh, may I suggest looking up some tutorials on uh, brush care uh, if you have a jar of very very strong thinner like lacquer thinner and if you're using good brushes I recommend the Delta synthetic brushes are very very cheap the super fine brush is like two bucks if you leave paint in it and it stiffens and it gets all funny and stuff um, soaking that in lacquer thinner for a little while, cleaning it down, and then soaking it in brush conditioner or just your normal hair conditioner. Straightening it out and then not touching them for a week or two uh, could uh, bring back a fine uh, paint brush to some sort of life, if not complete life, and bring back the tip. Um, I know a lot of people to bring the tip on their brush, they like to lick their brushes. Um, for people that use uh, solvent based paints, that's utterly uh, disgusting and toxic. Uh, for acrylic people, whatever. Um, it does bring a beautiful tip, but what I like to do is wash my hands, lick my fingers, and um, bring a tip like that. Uh, sometimes what's really disgusting, and I definitely do it off camera, if I've got solvents and crap on my brush and I need a fine um, tip, 
I've got a small container, I spit it a few times, I uh, lubricate my fingers in the saliva and bring a tip back to my brush. I don't know what's in human saliva, but for some reason that's really, really good at uh, massaging a shaggy brush into a brush with a tip again. It's uh, very, very strange. A human mouth does an even better job, but yeah, I'm, I'm not licking a brush. That's, 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 that's nasty. Don't, don't lick your brushes, even if using Vallejo. I mean, the Vallejo people are weird. I've heard rumors that when they were demonstrating Vallejo in a European model uh, show, uh, one of the crazy bastards opened the bottle and drank a bit of it to prove how non-toxic it is. Um, don't trust people that drink their own brand of paint, please. <laughs> but I'm not the biggest fan of Vallejo. That was really, really, really off topic. Um, yeah, 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 so that answers your um, question, mate. Next question, Lon242. You've asked quite a few questions. Good to have you back on board, mate. I'd like to start the 148 and 172nd planes in my backlog, but I find masking cockpit canopies difficult. Any tips on how to suck less when cutting such small strips of masking tape? Also, is there any surface prep or priming necessary for them? I imagine such fine lines of paint on clear would be very, very easy to scratch off. Any tips would be greatly appreciated. Uh, instead of cutting really, really fine bits of masking, and if I could find it without being too much of a hassle, which I can, there's a brand of masking tape called Izu masking um, tape. It's really, really, really fine tape that's anywhere between 1.2 to 0.6 millimeter in length. Buy those from your Japanese um, online hobby store supplies. They're really, really fine, so you can just crisscross your canopy with uh, those. Um, to be really, really effective at just cutting your normal Tamiya tape, you get one of those um, uh, checkered um, cutting mats. Lay your tape on the actual mat, get a ruler, get a knife, and just cut it down the length of the ruler and uh, that should get you really, really fine strips to lay it on the canopy. Uh, prepping the canopy, I've actually got a very, very interesting uh, technique that I tried one or two times and it's uh, served me quite well even though um, it's, it's still a bit uh, sloppy but that was from uh, a model that was uh, five, six, seven years ago. I would uh, spray Tamir Clear or Future Floor on both sides of the canopy and sort of let that dry for a couple of days and consider that to be a clear primer. Um, I'll do my painting on it, mask, paint, lift off. In the event that uh, anything spoils and it doesn't look great and you want to start from scratch, you soak that in Windex or bleach, no other chemical, pull it out, it's back to its original look, you start from fresh. If uh, Because the problem is canopies are just too easy to crack, mess up, um, do all sorts of damage and we actually talked about cutting um, clear pieces off. Uh, clear Gundam pieces are pretty cool, they're quite flexible, they're quite nice. The problem with military plane canopies are they're very brittle. When you cut them with your nippers uh, they have a tendency of uh, cracking or splitting or damaging the whole canopy. When you're removing um, the canopy from the nubs um, you can either use ultra fine uh, nippers like your god hands or your super fine tamirs or um, those are uh, quite expensive nippers or you can saw um, your uh, canopy directly off uh, the runners and then uh, just uh, polish the nubs off and that would prevent the cracking or splitting or chipping or whatever it does. I hope that answers your question. Uh, good luck with canopies. I find them a pain. I don't really do that many aircraft kits mostly because of them. That and tanks are just more fun from uh, my standing points. And um, I wish you luck with that. Oh, also, when you're done painting, you lift the masks, put a few more coats of clear, and that makes it a lot harder for uh, that paint to scratch off because it's being protected by clear paint. Last question, and we're still filming, so that's good. Uh, Tim, our good mate Tim, he asks a question every week. We love him. Hi, Alan. Back again with a question, sort of hobby-related, I guess. I've been an active member of a site for Gunpla, sponsored by an online seller, which you aren't a fan of. Yes, quite. 
this site is over flooded with nowadays with freeloaders ever since they uh, handed a presentator handed me down Oi, you alright mate? My cat was falling off the chair, he's very old so sorry about that Presentator handed me down can't express my contempt enough about those freeloaders and slowly I'm getting how you came to dislike the show. Anyways, do you know another good site to share one's information, tips and tricks and his or her works? The site I'm currently on is as good as uh, dead due to their awesome way of attracting new modelers. Sorry for my little rant, um, kept it as nice as possible for your, well, sorry. sorry for my little rant, kept it as nice as possible for your channel, much appreciated. Maybe something to talk about with the PhD man child, uh, that's, that's very much a possibility. As always, thanks for keeping the great uh, section of your channel alive and thank you for answering all of our questions. Cheers Tim. Uh, I completely understand where you're coming from, Tim. Um, a lot of people that are used to old uh, and very large flowing forums, um, they're slowly shutting down and all but completely uh, dead right now. Everything's moved on Facebook, and you're probably uh, referring to that. There's a lot of groups, and there are a few juggernaut groups run by people that were lucky to be in the position to moderate them. And um, since there's this large transfer of power, things are still settling, um, groups are fragmenting, there's uh, smaller and smaller and more specialty uh, groups, some related to people's areas where they live or uh, more um, specialist areas in the uh, hobby. I think instead of being dedicated or uh, true to one Facebook group, people sort of a member of a few and they get their uh, fix from multiple groups, which sort of sorts itself out like uh, forums, so if you're really into tutorials you join a Facebook tutorial group, if you want work in progresses and builds you join a, a build group, if you want anime discussions you join an anime group, so that's, that's, all, that's all pretty good and fine. Um, you want to know a good way to share information, uh, Facebook, if you're to share information there, uh, probably best to build up your own fan page and just post stuff on there, invite all your friends and it will just grow from there. The more content you put, the more people that will flock to you. I always believe uh, YouTube is uh, excellent for sharing information. Um, just the way that how Google has things uh, set up and I really do love this website that uh, it just optimizes things on um, the search engines and uh, the yeah, Google search engine and the and the YouTube search function. So if you make a tutorial on um, Tamiya Primer and only three people make tutorials on Tamiya Primer and they all do it on YouTube, it will always appear first on um, the algorithm on Google. And uh, it, it just works out. Maybe consider starting a YouTube channel for yourself. Maybe uh, a fan page. Uh, join a few uh, smaller specialist uh, groups on Facebook. And just have a little exploration. Things are still in the air. Things are still moving around. Uh, this is a time where the hobby is making major changes and people are taking advantages. And uh, there's just a lot of turmoil. But uh, it's settling down a lot from uh, last year. And all we have to do is be patient. Uh, throw the chips in the air, wait until where it lands, and then jump on those boats. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, um, companies and individuals are doing the wrong thing, and hopefully um, more and more people will see them for who they are, and uh, they may be shunned and less influence on the hobby. Uh, if you want to have a, more of a discussion about it, I'm happy to talk about it in private, but... Um, yeah, just pretty much the best advice is just go where it's fun, where you feel comfortable. It's more or less simple as that. If you're looking for a good place to hang out, I could probably uh, give you a couple of uh, recommendations. Uh, that concludes our Q&A session. Thank you very much for watching. This was a bit long. This was a bit different compared to other ones. Um, yet still quite interesting. We'll catch you guys later as soon as I get stuff together about um, our 4,000 subscriber competition. I'll let you guys know. Until then, peace out and catch you guys later.